Hey, Cross Park, this is your leadership update for October 6th. Glad to be with you. I've got two announcements, and then we'll talk a little bit more about some sermon content. First, we've been talking a lot about Alongside Families. We are really supportive of their ministry and excited to partner with them. Alongside Families exist to help families who are in crisis to give a dignified opportunity for parents who need help to be able to ask for and receive help and thus to be able to prevent families from disintegrating or children having to be put in foster care in situations where they really wouldn't need to if there was someone who could help them uh, during this moment of crisis that they might be having. So we're really excited to partner with them. One of the things that we've been talking about is the need for Cross Park people to uh, respond to the call to get involved. And so we had an, an, leader, an interest meeting, not a leadership meeting, a while back, and many of you were there. Uh, there are two more opportunities coming up here in the next week. So Monday, <clears throat> there are two Zoom information meetings. One is during the day, during the lunch hour from noon to one. One is in the evening from seven till eight. I will have the links and that info. It's in the weekly email. It'll also be in the email that you receive today. Uh, participating in an interest meeting is just that. You're just expressing interest and finding out more about the details of how Alongside Families works. So it does not obligate you to commit to anything. But it is a great next step. Um, and then following up on that, there'll be a training. Um, there'll be training opportunities later, uh, I believe, in November. So we would love for you, if you haven't had a chance yet, to further pursue what Alongside Families does and how it might work for you and your family. Uh, one of these interest meetings on Monday is a great way to check them out. So look in the email and click on one of those links. Secondly, we do have an upcoming membership class for Cross Park and it's not too late to participate. So if you have any interest in becoming a member, if you're not a member, you've been visiting and you would like to find out more about our church, we have a membership class on October 22nd. Uh, again, doesn't obligate you to ultimately join but there is info we need from you and for you before that meeting. So please email me, jeff at crossparkchurch.org, and let me know that you might be interested. We will send you the membership information, including some videos we want you to watch beforehand. And then on the 22nd, directly after church, we'll, have, uh, we'll bring in some lunch and we'll hit the highlights. We'll talk about what it means to be a member and what the process looks like, the, the what and the why and the how of membership at Cross Park. So again, just email me, Jeff at Cross Park Church, if you have any interest. Now, Sunday, I started my sermon with the following quote from C.S. Lewis. Enemy occupied territory, that is what the world is. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed, you might say landed in disguise, and is calling us to take part in a great campaign of sabotage. And so I've known that quote for many years, but I was thinking a bit more this week about what does that sabotage campaign look like? And most of us have a general idea of what sabotage is, but I found a great definition for it today. Sabotage is deliberate action aimed at weakening a polity, government, effort, or organization through subversion, obstruction, demoralization, destabilization, division, disruption, or destruction. So it's working in all sorts of different ways to undermine some group, some organization. Uh, in World War II, the Office of Strategic Services, which was the forerunner to the CIA, stated that sabotage against the enemy can look like this. Slashing tires, draining fuel tanks, starting fires, starting arguments, acting stupidly, short-circuiting electric systems, abrading machine parts. All of these things will waste materials, manpower, and time. And as Christians, we need to be aware we live in enemy-occupied territory, and thus, in one sense, we are at war. We are citizens of the true returning king, and I believe Lewis is on to something, that God is calling us to a campaign of sabotage. We are participating in spiritual warfare, and that means that our, both our goals and our ends have to be lined up with what Jesus is about. Uh, there are true spiritual realities, spiritual entities, spiritual forces. Our simple powers of physical observation do not tell us all the truth about the world. And Paul tells us we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against these spiritual powers, which means the ways we fight 
also are going to be different than the ways we function in the world. Our, our fighting has to be spiritually directed and defined by Jesus' goals and ways. So I think that means in part that there's not tons of direct conflict, open warfare with spiritual forces, at least not by the means that we might tend to think of, by military or political means, um, by public relations campaigns, etc. Rather, uh, we're fighting as saboteurs. We're trying to undermine, to obstruct, to discourage, to demoralize our enemy's efforts. So, as Christians who are in uh, league with our king who's returning to dismantle and tear down uh, unholy and undignified ways of living, we are constantly resisting, looking to tear down the things that keep us from the dignity that comes by being made in God's image. We're subverting the dominant paradigm. I've always liked that phrase. Um, a lot of the bumper stickers probably would mean something a little different than I mean, but we're actually subverting the dominant paradigm. We're not seeking our own ways. We're seeking instead to truly love others and put their needs ahead of our own. We're fighting a back against consumerism. Instead of simply trying to pad our dens with more toys and more luxuries, we're looking to give ourselves away and pursue true thriving for our friends and neighbors. Uh, I really liked the suggestion from the uh, OSS that acting stupidly can distract the enemy and waste his energy. This lines up really well with the New Testament idea of being a fool for Christ. You see it in 1 Corinthians. There, of course, are ways that we can be wrongly foolish. Uh, the Bible has lots to say against foolishness. And yet the New Testament takes the foolish idea and says, from the world's perspective, we're going to look foolish. But from God's perspective, uh, our foolish worldly efforts may be entirely what he's calling us to. And so in an increasingly post-Christian culture, standing up for certain things, caring about the gospel, caring about biblical ideas will often seem foolish. Again, we don't need to try hard to be foolish. Uh, we don't need to be abrasive, boorish. We don't need to try to be offensive, right? Uh, there are often times that we could say things much more graciously, much more clearly. We could say them without trying to cause offense at the same time. Uh, of course, if we are subverting the dominant paradigm, then oftentimes our stance on a biblical issue is going to be offensive to people. So we can't always avoid offense either. And yet this idea of sort of acting stupidly, being a fool for the gospel is such a great idea because by itself, it seems like we're accomplishing nothing. I'm standing up for this thing or I'm, I'm saying I'm a Christian. I'm saying I believe these things and everyone around me is laughing at me. They think I'm a fool. But rather than accomplishing nothing from uh, God's perspective, we may be doing great business. We may be bringing sabotage to bear on the enemy's plans because in our current culture, it's, it is shocking at times when people stand up for something different than the dominant paradigm and do it with some measure of dignity and grace. Plenty of people yell and scream. Plenty of people go along with the crowd. But if we're able to speak the truth and actually do it with love and grace, it might be a bit of a surprise to the enemy's plans. I was reminded of some of this this week as I'm rereading The Fellowship of the Ring by Tolkien. And at the Council of Elrond, they're discussing what to do with the ring. What are our options? And one of the characters says, the last thing the enemy expects is that someone will want to get rid of the ring, right? The ring is so powerful that everyone is tempted to use it, even use it for good things. Well, what if we use this for a good thing? We could, maybe we could turn the power of the ring into a positive, but the ring is wholly evil and corrupting. You can't use it for something good. And so the wiser heads prevail and say, the only option is to destroy it. And it's the one thing the enemy doesn't expect. He doesn't have the imagination to think that anyone would say no to the power that the ring offers. And so Frodo rightly concludes that rather than being a warrior, he's not going to confront Sauron. He's not going to fight with Sauron. He's simply planning to walk into Mordor quietly uh, to subvert what's going on and to drop the ring into the fires of Mount Doom. He's a saboteur not a warrior, and his efforts 
The, the enemy doesn't even have an inclination that that would be what anyone would do. And so he can subvert the enemy's plans by acting stupidly, by doing something that everyone thinks must be foolish. And yet it is precisely the right thing to do. So as Christians, we're often called to give away power, to be humble, to not promote ourselves, to function differently than anyone would expect in order to actually inhabit our identity as citizens of the king who has returned in disguise. So let's connect this now with uh, part of the main idea of the sermon, how our identity precedes our activity. Uh, this is tricky because a lot of times it does seem to go the opposite direction, right? Um, your, your constant regular activities form a part of your identity. If you do something all the time, if you do it well, then it tends to be what you're known for. And you could very easily argue your identity is from your activity. And that seems to, that's the opposite of what I said in the Sermon Sunday, right? I said identity precedes activity. But I still maintain that this is the case for Christians because achieving your identity, an achieved identity is fragile. Meaning, if you stop achieving, you lose your identity. Uh, what if you're known for your looks and your vigor, but then you get older and all those things change? What if you're known for high achievement and for whatever reason, maybe even you're continuing to do the same things you've always done, all of a sudden you're not producing the results that you used to? What if the markers and definitions of success in your area change midstream? And though you may be doing the exact same quality of work that was praised previously, now you're unable to seem successful. Uh, an achieved identity is fragile in this sense. It's also crushing. And I got this idea from Tim Keller, and you see it. An achieved identity is crushing because you always have to do more. You always have to be better. You always have to try to hold on to and not lose what you've accomplished. An achieved identity causes you to constantly perform. And while you might be legitimately performing good things, you might be quite driven to accomplish more. At the end of the day, you're not able to always achieve maximum performance. And for some of the reasons we already mentioned, you can't be totally comfortable with who you are based on your performance. This was made really clear to me many years ago. I remember watching live Michael Jordan's Hall of Fame speech for the Basketball Hall of Fame. Um, it was awful. Here's the greatest player in the world who accomplished as much as you can accomplish as a basketball player, everyone agreed that he was the greatest to ever play. In his Hall of Fame acceptance speech, he was petty, he was tearing other people down, he was one-upping people. And what it showed was that even his identity, his activity-secured identity, was fragile. It was fragile even in retirement, even with everyone saying that he's probably the best ever, he had to continue to compete and perform and try to show himself to be great. It seems that he built his identity right on his activity. And now he's not competing anymore. So now he has to show again somehow that he's so great. And it was both arrogant and insecure. His identity was so fragile and fraught that he had to make fun of other people in his Hall of Fame speech in order to keep a sense of his identity. So true identity is relational and received not achieved, right? Our best identity comes from God himself, from the work that Jesus has done for us. As his righteousness is credited to our account, we receive forgiveness and freedom and a better identity. We move from being sinners who try to do good things sometimes to saints who struggle mightily with sin, but we're fundamentally saints. Uh, as we saw in the prologue of John, an identity marker, we receive the right to become children of God. That identity is not something achieved. It's not something that we've earned. We simply get it by trusting Jesus. And trusting is resting, not working. And as we rest, there we're aware that we've been given on an identity that we can't get anywhere else and that can't be taken away from us. True identity is also relational. You know, most cultures in history have defaulted heavily towards the idea that the culture tells you who you are. You get a slot and the culture reinforces often with honor or shame reinforces uh, that you should stay in that slot. You should be this kind of thing, this kind of person. Um, we've, of course, moved all the way in the other direction as a culture where you define and determine your own identity. No one can tell you who you are. Only you can. But as I mentioned Sunday, that doesn't quite work. It's a little insufficient. And so we're constantly looking elsewhere for some sort of affirmation. 
Biblically, I argue that true identity comes from God himself, as we already said, because we're in him and with him. Our identity flows from him. Uh, we're connected to him by faith, and he redefines who we are. But also, God has put us in a community called the church, and the community is meant to properly affirm and confirm who we are. Uh, Grant and I were talking this week uh, about a book he's reading where the author renamed the cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 12, the healing cloud of witnesses. And I thought, that's beautiful and fitting. That's how it works. God tells us who we are. God defines us. And he puts us in a, a group, a, a community that will continue to affirm and confirm what God has said. The community is meant to tell us our true identities over and over again. We struggle to believe it. We struggle to work it out. And over and over, we do have to have the truth retold to us. But as our community in a healing way tells us who we are, we feel it and know it and believe it. So true identity is received from God. It's achieved by Jesus. It's received from God. And we feel and understand what it really means oftentimes as God's people tell us what they see and us when they tell us what God says about us. So I wanted to follow up on my comments Sunday. We've talked a lot about identity and activity, and we will continue to do so. Identity precedes activity. Of course, in some ways, our activities can confirm or deny our identity, but fundamentally, our identities are relational and received and not something we achieve. I'm trying to use these videos as an opportunity to either clarify things I've said, to go deeper on some concepts, to head towards some ideas that we'll be talking about in future weeks. Hopefully these are helpful to you. We only have you know 35 minutes or so in a sermon on Sunday. And so hopefully these videos are a, a venue where I can share a little bit more, some additional thoughts that might be helpful to you. Well, I'm looking forward to being with you Sunday. Again, 930 Sunday School for all ages, 1030 worship. We're going to look at Jesus calling his first disciples at the end of John 1. Thanks, Cross Park. We'll see you Sunday morning.